Hi, this is Steve at BlessedHopeForever.com. How did Rosh Hashanah become New Year's Day? Uh, in the Torah, the beginning of the year was clearly set in the spring. So what happened? You've heard me talk about March 8, 2019 being the spiritual new year. Now look, I love Israel. Okay, I, I want to just say that right from the outset here. Don't let anybody out there believe that I don't love God's people, the Jews. If you're a Christian, you love Israel. But let me talk about this. I want to clear this up. I've, I've had people question me about this. Uh, well, Steve, I thought the new year, uh, I thought we left 5778 back on September 11th of last year of 2018, and that ended 5778. So now we're in 5779. And you keep saying that the spiritual new year is March 8th. Uh, I've presented uh, my views on that as, as that being a spiritual new year. You have a civil new year in Tishri. You have a spiritual new year in Nisan in the spring. So l let me explain to you how I understand this because I know it's caused a lot of confusion. Here was, uh, here was the first mistake uh, that was made. All right, it, it started with a, a struggle to set a date on the part of the Jewish people. Uh, but wait, I mean, wait a minute, I thought that that had already been settled. Well, in fact, it was, as you'll see, but why was there a struggle to set a date for the Jews to determine when the new year started? Well, the simple truth is that the Jews wanted a date that would include, well, not only the Jews, but by universal commitment, the entire human race. That's the truth. The, the global community as a whole. Now, this is not some idea of my own. Uh, this is fact. And, and two possibilities were considered for debate. The two possibilities were Nisan, the month of Passover and Tishri, the, the month known for Rosh Hashanah. They wanted to strike a balance. Short story is they, they force fit something into place that biblically speaking, it didn't belong. Now, this is not surprising to me since God set Israel aside in unbelief. But now they would argue that by introducing a second new year, it made it better. Now, I would argue that by doing so, they made the, the real new year that God gave uh, in Nisan less significant. That in essence, they polluted the stream. God dictated when the new year should be. God told us. Okay. They added to what God delivered to Moses and Aaron. In the Torah, the beginning of the year was clearly set at the first of Nisan. That's right. In the context of a description of the first Passover, the Lord said to Moses and Aaron in the land of Egypt, this month shall mark for you the beginning of the months. It shall be the first of the months of the year for you. Exodus 12, 1 and 2. Exodus 12, 1 and 2. This new year celebrated the creation of the Jewish nation through the redemption of the Israelites from Egypt. The month of Nisan, as the first of the months, coincided with the beginning of Jewish national history. And this has been forever inscribed in the inspired text. It will remain so for all eternity. It can't be changed. 
it should not be down here on earth. It should not be changed, taken away from, or added to. Did you know that when Jesus stood before the Jews, they had what, what uh, I've heard some people call, we talked about that, this in Bible college, they had fence laws, laws added to prevent the breaking of the commandments given them by God. They set up fence laws so you wouldn't come near to getting, you know, breaking God's laws. Think of it as a double layered security. Now, I did the same thing with my chicken coop, okay? I, I'm, I'm not joking, I'm being serious. I did this with my chicken coop. The coop was made secure but I put a fence around the coop as an extra layer of security. You know, we got a lot of dogs running around here in the country. Same thing, same thing. The Torah made no mention of a new year at Tishri 1. Yet today, the entire Jewish religious experience is built around it. The Torah's reference to Tishri 1 is sparse altogether, it, describing a holiday characterized primarily by the blowing of a shofar. Uh, most of you are familiar with the verse, uh, in the seventh month, on the first day of the month, you shall observe complete rest, a sacred occasion commemorated with loud blasts. Uh, you shall not work at, at your occupations, and you shall bring an offering by fire to the Lord. The name Rosh Hashanah is not mentioned, nor is there a reference to its function as a day of judgment and anniversary of the world's creation. So, enter Judaism's primary book of Jewish legal theory, I'm talking about the Mishnah, uh, it was published at the end of the second century, the end of the second century AD, the Mishnah, it, it's an edit, edited record of the complex body of material known as oral Torah that was transmitted in the aftermath of the destruction of the Second Temple in 70 AD, the destruction of the Second Temple by the Romans in 70 AD. There was no Mishnah during the time of Christ. And the Mishnah was a response to catastrophe. Rabbi Judah the Patriarch, he undertook to collect and, and edit a study edition of these laws for the purpose or in order that the learning not vanish. The temple had already been destroyed 130 years prior to its publication. According to the Mishnah, the temple still exists and the laws that governed it are expressed in the present tense. Present tense. The Mishnah ignores the events of the Roman occupation of the land of Israel. Just outright ignores it. And the idea was to describe and promote a life of sanctification in which the rituals of the temple are adapted for communal participation in a world that has no temple, which escapes the ups and downs of history. I can put it another way. In other words, the temple may have been utterly destroyed. Well, in fact, it was. But its meaning and purpose was going to be preserved from there on out, no matter what the future held. And, of course, well, it's not surprising where this led. It led to a dispute between sages, rabbinic sages, such as uh, when does one begin the morning prayers? Uh, how does one treat uh, produce that may or may not have had the priestly gifts separated from it? 
how does one constitute a Jewish marriage? Uh, there were a lot of things. What are the what are the limitations of the liability of somebody, uh, someone who watches another's property? I mean, we're talking about a lot of stuff. Uh, can cheese and meat be on the same table? That that's you know. Uh, how much water drawn, uh, drawn water invalidates a ritual bath, and the list goes on and on and on. Thousands, literally thousands of issues, in fact, uh, on all of these issues and on thousands of similar issues, the Mishnah includes various opinions. And I'll remind you again of my chicken coop. The Mishnah specifically defines Rosh Hashanah's New Year, quote unquote, status. It, it actually gives us that. Quoting from the Mishnah, it states the first of Tishri is the beginning of the year for years, sabbatical cycles, and the Jubilee, end quote. The functions of this new year relate primarily uh, to the agricultural cycle and the beginning of a new harvest year. But the Mishnah also begins to assign to it theological meaning. So, sometime between, between the Torah and the Mishnah, the autumn Tishri New Year gained in pop, gained a, a ascendance and transformed into a major celebration, and the Nisan New Year was left as a marker of the months and festivals in the calendar year. And now, theories abound about the causes of this transition. You know, why did it? Why did it happen? The simple, straightforward truth is, that is lost in a web of historical change. Rabbis are still arguing about when the new year should begin. They're, they're arguing today. Despite the conclusions of historians as well as archaeology, nothing's conclusive, which uh, astounds me given the fact that what God said should be conclusive enough for anybody. But then therein lies the problem. So the truth concerning the issue continues to be murky. Never have liked that word, murky. Murky, I don't even like the sound of it. Nehemiah 8, 1 through 8, never refers to to a New Year's celebration, Tishri 1. It describes Ezra reading the book of the law before the people on the first day of the seventh month. And it was a day of importance, no doubt. It, it, but it is not said to be the Jewish New Year. Some scholars believe that the existence of pagan New Year celebrations actually kind of influenced the timing of the, the Nisan and, and Tishri New Years. But most, or not most, but many scholars would argue that can't be true because the pagans also celebrated both. They celebrated both. It seems they too were confused. Some scholars have suggested Nisan was the new year in the kingdom of Judea, while Tishri was new year in the northern kingdom of Israel. In the Qumran literature, from where we, we, we find the Dead Sea Scrolls, Nisan is always the new year. Still confused? Now, personally, I am convinced that what we are looking at here 
is probably one of the most remarkable testimonies of the natural man's creative imagination and, and his never ending propensity to or tendency to muck things up, to confuse matters, all of which could have been avoided by simply, get this, just accepting and believing what God said is the truth of the matter. The plain truth is that the Jews have accepted the existence of a calendar with more than a single new year. God said one. They said, no, we got to have two. Whereas some saw na national redemption, Jewish, Israeli, you know, from the Israeli standpoint as the central or essential role of Jewish history and held with the Torah that Nisan was the first month. Well, others with a more universal idea in mind supported Tishri as more important to all humanity. Did you get that? Within the universalist idea of Tishri, issues of sin and redemption were seen to be ap applicable to all human beings. Therefore, Tishri was emphasized by attributing different roles to the new years of, of Nisan and Tishri. Jewish scholars believe, they believe, that they have helped integrate perspectives of world, nation, and individual within the Jewish religion. So as I see it, by their own admission, the Jews have revealed the truth concerning how Rosh Hashanah became New Year's Day. What I would contend it was, it was, is that it was never meant to become, quote unquote, anything, but rather God was meant to be believed. As it is with any question or issue, the very fact that a debate exists is evidence that something's amiss. I mean, we, when we're in agreement, there's harmony. When the truth is, is simply accepted for what it is, and we don't doubt God, we don't call him a liar, we believe God, then there is no debate. There's no debate. I don't know what world that you live in, folks. But I live in a world that has taken the moral high ground against true spirituality, which it hates. I live in a world where a human merit-based religious system that has, has mixed Judaism with its Christianity as a way of life. I live a world religious system that is pursuing universalism as a long needed solution to diversity and a Jewish nation that believes that it must embrace universalism in order to survive as a nation and a planet, a world as a whole that believes that globalism is the way of the future. So I contend we presently remain within the Hebrew year 5778, which ends March 8. This is Steve. I love you all. I truly do, including you Jews. Thanks for watching.